arrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Isaiah 11, verses 4 through 9. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all of my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Revelation 5, 13. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea, and all that is in them singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. May God add blessings to the reading of his word today. Well, we've been looking at the topic of heaven the various questions about what heaven is and what to expect or at least what scripture seems to um, say about various topics such as uh, what's heaven like and who goes to heaven what will we look like when we're there will our loved ones recognize us questions like that and today I'm going to be addressing a question that sometimes gets asked but most often by children. And the question is this, will animals, specifically our pets, be in heaven? Now, most people have ideas about how this should work. And most of us who have beloved pets are biased as well, I'll admit to that. So it's easy to come up with a pat, quick answer to this question. You know, I think a lot of us have dodged this question or just settled for a pat answer. And I could offer up some easy pat answer today, like this. All dogs go to heaven. As for cats, well, of course, they end up in the other place. <laughs> I'm just kidding, okay? I'm just kidding. You notice I didn't say that when the children were here. I love cats, too, okay? I really do. I don't understand them, but I love cats. <laughs> you know, when I was a small kid, probably around, I don't know, eight years old, maybe six to eight, somewhere in there, um, we spent a lot of time at my grandmother's house who lived in town. Um, my dad was a policeman and my mom was a banker. And until they got off work, we would stay at my grandma's house, which we had this big yard uh, and kids, neighbor kids we played with. And, I, and we saw this stray cat that nobody knew who it belonged to. And it had stripes, it was gray, it was a kitten. And um, saw it day after day, and nobody claimed it, nobody wanted it. And finally, I asked my parents if I could keep it, and they said yes, because we lived on a 300-acre farm, and it was going to be an outdoor cat. And uh, so we loaded the cat up and took it home and named it Tiger. I named the cat Tiger. That was my first pet. And what I remember best about Tiger is that no matter how I was feeling or what was going on, I could go out on this back step. It was a breezeway between our house and the shed. And I could sit on that step and Tiger within, wherever she was, somehow would come up and, and jump up on my lap and lay down and stay there for eons. I mean, she'd be there all day if I sat there all day. And that's how I remembered her. And uh, she was like a constant companion to me. And as I went off to college, and she was still alive, um, you know, would have been about 15, 16, 17 years old. Um, I was in college during the blizzard of 78 of Ohio Northern. And um, I came home my first time after the blizzard, and Tiger was nowhere to be found. So 
I never got to see her again. But uh, my memory of that first pet of mine was just a very loving companion. That was just a bond between her, the cat and myself. And I'll always remember her that way. And so um, uh, I think pets, you know, you go into, you know, you go into pet land and there's that sign that they put up. That, and, and, it, and it's true, it's not completely, I mean, and there's more to it than that. The sign says pets make life better, right? You seen that, pet land? Has anybody seen it? I'm pretty sure it's still there. And the fact is, pets make life better. But they also make life harder, right? There's a lot of work, you know? There's a lot of work to taking care of a pet, keeping a pet in good shape. And so I, I think that uh, as much as we, as we just want to, you know, kind of not deal with this question or, or just give a quick answer, I think the real question is, does the Bible give any guidance on this question? Will pets be in heaven? Um, I have to tell you, you know, there's a, not a whole lot dedicated to the subject in, in the Bible that I've seen. Uh, and what there is, is not entirely clear. It's, it's up for some speculation, I believe. But after researching this and checking it out and praying about it, uh, because it's a big responsibility to stand before you and answer questions about a place that I've never been and relying on some guidance from Scripture to come up with some sort of direction. But here is why I believe that pets will be in heaven with us. Here's, here's my opinion on this. God made us and God made all living creatures, right? He made us all. In fact, the creatures were here before we were. And in the beginning, God spoke animals into existence. It says in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 25, God saw that it was good. And that's the same thing God said when he made us and when he made the stars, all other creation. It is good. All right? So this tells us one thing, that God highly values human, and, and, and not just human, but all living Creatures, all life. God values life. Right? He, he sees it from a, a very important perspective. In fact, all of his creation, you think about this, all of his creation were meant to live in peaceful uh, harmony for eternity. We were all meant to live on. None of us were meant to die or get sick. And all his creation was meant to continue. It was only after the fall of man where sin and death and sickness entered the picture and changed our earthly environment. And it was only after God flooded the earth in judgment that God allowed animals to be used as food. You know, prior to that, to the flood, all humans and animals ate plants only. We were all vegetarians. You can check this out in Genesis chapter 1, verse 30. After the judgment of the flood, God mentioned another new consequence of our sin. God said to Noah, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground, and upon all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. And for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each man, too. I will demand an accounting for the life of this fellow man. Well, there was now, for the first time, separation, danger, distance between the men and the animals, the men and women and the animals. This is part of living in a fallen, cursed world. Yet despite this new arrangement, God made a covenant, a promise, not to destroy the earth again by flooding. Now who did God make this covenant with? You know, well, we tend to think it was God made the covenant with Noah, right? Or Noah and his, and his ancestors, right? 
That's not quite complete. Genesis 9, chapter, or verses 8 to 13 says this, Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant I am making between me and all life on the earth. And then he talked about the rainbow. The promise was not just for man. It was a promise from God to his creatures as well. God values all life. Sickness, death, exploitation, cruelty, all of that is from man, not from God. And sin is such a serious offense to God that God required atonement for it, for sin, and said that all sin leads to death. All sin leads to death. And so ultimately, God provided the requirement that his son be the sacrifice to make atonement for our sins. Sin must be judged. Sin must be paid for. Sin leads to death. You know, this curse of sin affects us all, men and beasts, the guilty, the innocent. And did you notice God mentioned in Genesis 9 that he will demand an accounting from all life. All men will be held accountable. And get this, all animals are held accountable too. Now, I don't know whether punishment for animals happens in this life or the next. I don't know. But once again, this is clear. God treasures all life. Luke chapter 12 says that not one sparrow is forgotten by God. Proverbs 12.10 says that a righteous man cares for his animals. God loves animals and wants us to care for and respect them as well. Does this mean that they will be with us in heaven? Well, only God knows for sure, but I think so. When you read about John's vision of heaven, guess what he saw? Living creatures. This passage of Revelation chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Also before the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, now granted, None of these four creatures sound much like they resemble our household pet, Fido. But if we, if we get spiritual bodies, different bodies, when we're resurrected, well, maybe it's possible that our pets do as well. You know, and it wasn't just four creatures up there. The Bible mentions horses being in heaven. and says this in Revelation 5, 13. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen and the elders, the elders fell down and worshiped. Creatures in heaven. Creatures on earth and in heaven praising God. Book of Romans 8.21 mentions that one day it says all of creation will be liberated from the bondage of the curse. It says all of creation. 
Isaiah chapter 11 speaks of this a vision of all things being made new. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, like the, like the ox. The infant will play near the hole with the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious. In other words, the garden restored. Do I believe the Bible gives hope that our pets will join us in heaven? I absolutely do. I'm going to show you a very short video clip that I believe could well be a kind of preview to what we might expect when we walk through the gate and enter heaven. Teach us how to help people. 
the lost, especially the least. You know, my daughter Sarah decided for her birthday three years ago that she wanted a, a dog. And all I thought was, well, we already have a dog. <laughs> you know, we've got rabbits. We've got a cat. <coughs> we had two cats. And she wanted to get, she wanted to rescue a dog from the you know, humane society. And I had little choice in it because my wife was on her side. <laughs> <laughs> And it was her birthday. <laughs> I could appeal to sanity for so long, okay? I had to give up. Man. But uh, we, we ended up finding a, a, a puppy that was a, a mutt in every way you could imagine. No one knew what she was. Uh, alien is all I could figure out. Very quirky, frightened dog. They even, they even mentioned to us that she had tried to bite couple of their employees when they tried to walk her. How that got past us, I don't know how, I don't know how we got past that. I just don't know. But um, we, we took her home, Sarah named her Sugar, and I'm not kidding, it took over two months for her to stop barking at me and growling at me whenever I walked in the room. And all I thought was, this is now my life. <laughs> And even still, I mean, she's three years old now, even still, uh, when, when Sam's friends come over, who've been over like 50, 60 times, she still hides, barks, and growls, and, and occasionally will come out under the table or whatever. But, um, but she's also very playful and hilarious at times. And she's taught me much about the need to be patient, to, uh, to be more sensitive. <laughs> uh, and to appreciate how things don't go as quickly as we like sometimes. That's especially true with other people. So she's brought a lot of laughter and joy into my house. And, and pets can provide important lessons about life. They teach us to be more compassionate to other people. Pets, I, we have to be careful not to put them on pedestals. They were never meant to replace our relationships with people. And I know for certain people, they're kind of a replacement, and that's not good, it's not healthy. You know, you hear about people who have 19, 40 some cats, or whatever. You know, or, and I'm not here to judge them, but I'm saying, pets teach us how to love people, is the way it needs to work, okay? We must be careful that we uh, learn from them, and apply that learning to dealing with other people. Our hearts can become softened by our pets. God has given us this gift of companionship, of stewardship, where we're actually placed in sole responsibility as to whether that pet's going to make it or not make it, and how well their kind of quality of life they're going to have. It comes down to us. God has given us that distinct um, responsibility over the animals. Uh, animals, they require a lot of care, and they make messes, but the truth is, so do people. And just as God tends to uh, love us despite our failings, this is how we can learn to love each other. So God visits us in our own version of the pound. He sees the self-made cages that we surround ourselves, that are surrounding us. He sent his son to pay the price so that we might be rescued. God calls us his. He labels us as adopted and loved. He names us. And one day God will take us home to a place where we can be unleashed, run free, be safe from predators, and rest in peace. I hope our series has made you long for this day more. I hope you've come to appreciate the joy of heaven and the temporariness of this life, the fragileness, and the importance of dealing with all of God's creatures um, with love and with care. Respect. I think that our pets are just tremendous blessing, and I think so are the people left and right of you, and behind and in front of you. Let's never fail to show that in how we live, so that we'll be fit for heaven. Amen. As the praise team comes and.